How you doing Saturday night? It's not really Saturday night, is it? Look outside. Uh, just a month ago, it was dark when we started these services. So, my gosh, uh, I think that means spring is here. Amen? Uh, don't get your hopes up, but I heard a lot of snow melting today. I love that sound. So anyway, and plus it's getting close to Easter. Thanks for being here tonight. My name is Troy, one of the pastors, and grateful to have you here with us this evening. In a few weeks, as you heard uh, Alexandra say, um, we are going to be celebrating uh, two of the greatest events that have ever happened in history. We're going to be celebrating the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And those two things without a doubt, um, changed everything for everybody. Thank you, Scott Ford. I appreciate that. I'll, I'll say it again. Those two things changed everything for everybody. Amen? Yeah, man. I mean, none of us. We, don't, we're, we're, we have hope. And we have a hope for a new day, a new life, all of that stuff. And so, I mean, in just a span of three days, a long weekend, Jesus flipped the script for every person that's ever lived. And what he did has become known as, it has become called the good news. Or maybe I put it this way, the good news. There's some good news out there, but this is the good news. It's news that is so good that it needs to be shared with everyone we know. And this Easter, this Easter weekend, two weekends from now, uh, is another opportunity for you and I to do that, to share this good news with our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers. And in light of that, tonight what I want to do is I want to read uh, a parable. I want to read one of Jesus' parables to you tonight and hope that it kind of lights a fire in your heart. It's one of Jesus' most well-known parables, most famous parables, no doubt about it. And its significance when he said it is huge. Now, the people that heard it, uh, they didn't really know at that time how big this was. But, uh, and the problem with us when we hear this parable is it's so familiar to us. We've heard it that it's kind of lost its impact a little bit. But um, I'm going to do it anyway, and my hope is it'll stir you up a little bit. One of the amazing things about this story is that every one of us, every single one of us here tonight, is actually one of the characters in this story. We're one of them. We're in the story. We're all in it. We can all identify with uh, one or more of the characters. And like any good movie or a novel that you've read, um, you and I are going to be tempted to identify with the hero in this story. But let's just be clear. You and I are not the hero in this story, okay? I promise you. I, my hope is that one day I'll become like the hero, uh, but, uh, but that's a process, and, and, and uh, I'm not there yet, okay? But the truth be told, um, uh, I have been all of the other characters in this story at one time or another in my life. At different seasons of my life, I've been this guy, and I've been that guy, and I'm sure that tonight you're going to find yourself in this parable too. In fact, that's why Jesus spoke in parables. Did you know this? He spoke in parables because it was a polite way of, of, uh, of him being able to help us see ourselves as we actually are, not as we imagine ourselves to be. To really look in a mirror and see what's going on in our hearts. And so I hope that you get that tonight. Now, if you're not a Christian and you're here tonight, don't check out. Because here's the thing. Um, when Jesus told this story... There were no Christians back then. He wasn't telling it to Christians. Uh, the term, that term didn't even exist. Um, and so I want to encourage you, if you're not a Christian, to just play along and to listen to this and to try to find yourself in this story too, okay? Luke chapter 15 is where we're going to start. If you have your Bibles, you can open up there. If not, you can follow along on the screen here. Um, Luke uh, was a physician who became a historian. I don't know if you know this, Luke went out, uh, he was so captivated by this story, he went out and investigated and interviewed hundreds of people who saw and met Jesus. And he begins this story in, in his little writing, his, story, his book, uh, by saying this. In verse 1 he says this, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Now, this, that little statement has always fascinated me because... Um, think about it. You have the worst of the worst attracted to the best of the best, right? I mean, this is just, this isn't how things usually work. I mean, uh, the, peop the people who were the least like Jesus, this is amazing. The people who were the least like Jesus, liked Jesus and liked listening to Jesus. 
I mean, he was kind of a religious figure, and he could have been a turnoff to a lot of people, but people loved listening to him. And it's also interesting to me that Luke distinguishes between tax collectors and sinners, as if tax collectors have their own category of badness. They were a whole other level. I mean, they were traitors. They were ripping off their fellow countrymen. They were just evil, wicked people. And so they weren't even considered sinners. They were just called tax collectors. Ugh. And sinners, sinners were simply people who kind of back then were basically separated from most of Jewish society, either because of their jobs. Their jobs had either made them ceremonially unclean. They couldn't go to the temple or maybe their lifestyle really didn't measure up to the religious people's standards. But for what reason or whatever, one reason or another, uh, sinners were attracted to this rabbi named Jesus. And that's fascinating to me, okay? Verse 2, he goes on. He says, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complained. Is that what it says? They complained. They muttered. Some versions of the Bible say, everybody mutter. Mutter, mutter. Yeah, they did that. They grumbled amongst themselves. They're like, this man welcomes sinners. He's okay with sinners and even eats with them. Now, again, let me just explain to you. The Pharisees and the teachers were the religious elites of the day. Um, they considered themselves to be in good standing with God and with his word, the Torah, and, and their interpretation of the Torah. And they, were, they too, like I said, were intrigued by Jesus, but they were bothered by him. Um, they couldn't understand. They couldn't understand that if Jesus was from God, why didn't he want to spend more time with them? That just didn't make sense to them. I mean, they were the ones who knew God best. They were the one who, who, who followed God's laws to a T. And they're like thinking, why wouldn't Jesus want to hang out with us instead of them, you, those sinners, right? He doesn't even try to get away from those people. He even goes and eats with them. Now, that's interesting. Back then, eating with someone was, uh, was a big deal. This was a big deal because uh, there weren't really restaurants. And so if you were eating with someone, you were likely eating with them in their home. They had invited them into their homes, and thus it was kind of formal. And in some ways, it was very intimate and personal, right? And so that fact, uh, the fact that Jesus uh, did that surprised, obviously, the sinners. They couldn't believe that someone who was so well-known and who was religious and, and all of that would come and eat with them. But it also bothered the Pharisees. Uh, they're like, when is the shoe, the other shoe going to drop here? When is Jesus going to set these sinners straight and tell them that what they're doing is wrong? When is he going to correct them? Because it just didn't seem that he was interested in that. And so my point here is, is that everyone was confused by Jesus. Both sides were confounded by Jesus. The religious and the non-religious were kind of mixed up by them. They were confused by the same thing. They were confused with this. How does God view sinners? They, that, that, that they wanted to know, how does God see sinners? How does God see good people and bad people? And Jesus took this opportunity because of this conversation between the Pharisees and the religious teachers of the law. He took this opportunity to clear up this confusion for both groups, both groups at the same time. Now, before we jump into this story, I just want to ask a quick question here. Uh, just so we know what's what. Um, don't raise your hand and don't elbow the person next to you. But I just got to ask, are there any sinners here? That's a little too enthusiastic, Scott. I don't know what's going on. But more specifically, are you a sinner? Are you a sinner? Now, some of you have heard that word before, loosely used, and you might be going, give me a definition. What's the definition of a sinner? Well, let me make it real easy for you. Um, uh, have, have you ever mistreated someone? Have you ever um, hurt someone? See, this is, this is how Jesus defined it. Jesus would say that sin is simply doing something or not doing something that brings harm to someone else or to yourself. That would be sin. And, and so have you done that? Have you been that way to somebody and, and maybe another question is, is do you know someone uh, else who's done that? Are you thinking of someone in your life that you're sitting next to? They're definitely a sinner. Have you ever looked at someone's life and thought, why are they doing that? Why are they acting this way? 
right? Uh, maybe, you know, have you ever thought and looked at someone and said, man, they should, be, they should be ashamed of themselves, of what they're doing. How can they live their life like that? How can they vote that way? Can I get an amen in election year? You know you've looked at people and go, man, I can't believe those people. They're just too messed up to even bother with. Have you ever looked at someone like that? Let me ask you this question. Have you ever wondered if God sees those people the same way you see those people? Or better yet, has it occurred to you that uh, the way you see people and the way God sees people might not be the same? Has that ever occurred to you? I know that I've struggled with that. I view someone and I think I've got the corner of the market. I got them pegged. But I often think, I wonder how God sees them and how God thinks about them. And so, back to the story, instead of addressing each group separately, Jesus uh, talks to them uh, and, and addresses them simultaneously. He speaks to those who feel like they're on God's side and who know right from wrong, and he speaks to those who feel like they're on the outside, who don't really know God and don't know really right from wrong at the same time. But here's the thing, neither one of these groups understood this at the time, but Jesus is about to blindside them. He's sneaking up on them. He's going to get them both. He's going to catch both of them in a play. And if you and I tonight will listen to this story with a fresh set of ears, um, because we've already heard it, um, I have a feeling that Jesus might blindside you as well. He might get me as well. That maybe at the end of this message, you and I will think, oh, no, oh, no, I am guilty of that. I've done that. And so Jesus begins by, by warming up with two little parables. He, he does little warm-up parables, I guess you could say. The first thing he does is he turns to the men that are in the crowd, and he asks them a question. He says, hey, guys, listen, if you, let's say you had 100 sheep, and one of those sheep got lost. What would you do? What would you do? Of course, you would leave those 99 and you would go out searching for that one until you find it, right? You, you would do that. And, and all the men are like nodding. That, that makes sense. I mean, uh, you know, the idea of a sheep all by itself out there in the wilderness, you know, the danger. Uh, you you got to do something. You couldn't sleep at night if you let that happen. You have to do something. And so Jesus said there, but, but when you find that sheep, uh, wouldn't you go home and wouldn't you get on the phone and wouldn't you call all your friends and say, hey, man. It's party time. I lost my sheep, but I found it again, right? Wouldn't you do that? And the men in the crowd are probably thinking, well, that might be a little over the top, okay? But yes, we would be happy and we would, we would probably, you know, call up a couple of our friends and share the news, right? And so then Jesus, at the end of this, steps outside of the parable. He comes out of the story and he makes a statement um, that would have uh, shocked everybody there. He says this, he says, let me tell you something about God that you don't know. He says this, he says, in the same way I tell you, there is more, listen to me, there is more joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who don't need to repent. Let me repeat that again. There is more joy in heaven when one person turns their life and heads back, right, then 99 people who are doing it right and rocking and rolling with Jesus and rolling with God. Wow. Uh, the Pharisees hear this and they're thinking, wait a second, man. Are you suggesting that, uh, that God isn't rejoicing over our obedience and over our goodness? I mean, seriously. I mean, isn't, isn't that what God wants from us? Isn't, isn't that what God values the most from us, being good and being obedient? Isn't, aren't we what God is looking for? That's what they're thinking. The sinners are sitting there thinking, whoa, wait, wait a second, Jesus. Are you actually inferring that we are like a dumb sheep that has wandered off and needs to be rescued? I mean, both parties are equally offended. They're just, they're totally offended. Jesus has rattled their cages with this single little illustration. He's got their attention now. They're like, oh, what is he saying? What is he doing? 
And so Jesus goes on. In verse 8, he says this. He turns to the women and he says, Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one of them. Now the ladies, they hear this and they're kind of surprised. They're like, he's including us in the story. No one, no one ever does that. We never talk about us. And so he's including us. Now you and I, I, you may not know this, but this illustration has often gotten lost on us because we don't understand what he's talking about. But the people that heard it, they instantly got it. Jesus was referring to the coins that a father would give his daughter as dowry. Yeah, um, uh, the daughter would take these 10 uh, coins, the father would give them silver coins or something, and she would sew them into a necklace or, or a headgear of some sort, and they would wear it when they would go out on special occasions to other people's weddings or other people's events, and she would wear those things until she got married. But on the day that she would get married, she would give those coins to her husband as a wedding gift, right? And so losing just one of those coins... Uh, would be like losing a, 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 one of the diamonds out of an engagement ring. She wouldn't stop looking for that until she found it. I mean, she would turn her whole house upside down searching for that coin. And Jesus says that when she found it, when she found it, she, would, she too would call her friends and say, Hey, come, <laughs> celebrate with me. My coin that was lost has now been found. And then Jesus kind of, I can imagine him smiling at the women and, 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 and basically saying, ladies, listen to me. That's how your heavenly father feels when one sinner returns back to him. That's how God feels when, when a person comes back home to him. Now again, the Pharisees are listening to this and they're thinking, why isn't Jesus celebrating us? And our good behavior and our knowledge of his word. Why isn't he giving us kudos for this? But the sinners and the uh, tax collectors, they're still thinking, are you suggesting that God is actually on the lookout for us? That he wants us? That we have some value to him? Because we haven't really gotten that impression from everybody else or maybe even from him. And so Jesus has got everybody sitting on a ledge trying to figure out what's going on. And then he tells his most famous, his most powerful parable that he ever told. And, and the audience cannot begin to fathom the importance of this story. Again, you and I have heard this. We, we know what's coming. But we, they could not understand what, God, what Jesus was about to do. Jesus right now is about to pull the curtain back and show everyone just how much our Heavenly Father loves them. And how much um, He loves the people that are standing across the aisle from us. You know, people that we aren't like us. People that are different from us. God loves them both. And here's the rub. Jesus wants you and I to know how much He loves us and how much He loves those who are standing across from us. Who aren't in this church with us who aren't like us. And so, how much does God love them? This much. In verse 11, Jesus tells the story. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger son said to his father, Father, I want you to give me my share of the estate. Now instantly, the crowd groaned. <laughs> they were unified. They were now on the same side with a common emotion, disgust. They're like, who would say or do such a thing? I mean, this kid is worse than a tax collector to say that to his father. That is the worst thing. I mean, it's as if the son had told his dad, Dad, I've been waiting and wanting you to die. But you're still here. And so I don't want to wait anymore for this. And so let's pretend that you're dead. So that um, you can give me my inheritance now. And I'm telling you, the audience is thinking, this brat needs to be beaten up. He needs to be thrown out of the house. 
He needs to be uh, disinherited. He needs to be taken out of the will with this move. I mean, that, everybody is thinking that. But Jesus throws a curveball. He surprises them. In verse 12, he says this. No one saw this coming. He said, so the father divided his property between them. The father took everything that he had and began to divide it up between them. For, for everybody listening to this back then, this story went from bad to bizarre. This was just weird. They're like, how could he do that? That's crazy. How could, how could he even do it logistically? I mean, uh, you would have to divide all the cattle and all the sheep and, and all of the land up. You'd have to sell the land. You'd have to sell the buildings. And you'd have to sell them all separately. This was not a simple thing. This would take months and months to do. The father would be crazy to do that. I'm telling you, at this point, no one is leaving. <laughs> They're all hooked right now. They're hanging on Jesus' every word. They are engaged. They're agitated. They're frustrated. Some of them are processing this a little bit. They're thinking, what is going on here? They're like, wait a second. First you tell a story about a lost sheep. Then you tell a story about a lost coin. But now all of a sudden you've shifted gears and you're talking about this, this bad son, this bad monkey of a son. What's the connection between them? You see, they couldn't see it coming, right? Um, he's blindsiding them. Now, you and I, we can see it coming because we know the story. We know what's about to happen next. We know that the son was about to become lost to his father. We, can, we know that. We know that this son is about to go away and become lost to this father that loves him. But here's the thing. Instead of stopping the son, um, the father chooses a different approach. He decides that the only way to possibly get his son back is to let his son go. I mean, it's a huge gamble. I mean, you would think that he would fight with him and argue with him, wrestle with him to the ground or something. But he realizes, I think the only way I'm going to get this kid to ever come back is i got to let him go. And not only that... He grants the boy his wishes. He gives them everything he asks for. And the audience is thinking, what a foolish, foolish thing to do. What a foolish father this is. He should just beat him up and be done with it. But Jesus continues. Verse 13, he says this. Not long after that, uh, the younger son took all that he had gotten and he set off for a distant land and there he squandered all of his wealth in wild living. In other words, um, he scattered and wasted everything his father had given him. I mean, think about this. Everything that it took his father to get over a lifetime, the son blew it all. I mean, in just a few months. And the crowd is fuming. I mean, they're like this ungrateful, spoiled rotten monkey. He took what he didn't deserve and what he didn't earn and he just flushed it down the toilet. It's a travesty. It's a travesty. But Jesus is just warming up, man. He's going to dig in deeper here. Watch this. In verse 14, it says that he says that after he had spent, after the son had wasted everything, there became a severe famine in that country, and the son began to starve. Now, instantly, the audience is thinking what you and I might be thinking. That is God right there. This is God judging that bad monkey for all that he's done. I mean, they're thinking he's, he's getting exactly what he deserves. I mean, this is good. Okay, now this story is starting to make sense. Good, good, good. But Jesus goes on. He says, and the kid at this point, is so hungry that he does something you won't believe. He says he, he takes a job that no Jewish kid would ever take. He takes a job, get ready to this, feeding pigs. I mean, clearly, this kid has hit rock bottom. I mean, in Jewish culture, that's as low as you can go right there. He's, now, he's separated from his father. He's separated from his family. And worse than that, he's now in a foreign land and he's feeding pigs. That is not kosher. And this has turned into a nightmare for this family. 
Except, back on the farm, um, uh, they've heard reports come in uh, about uh, how the younger brother is doing and what he's up to. And the older brother couldn't be happier. I mean, he is tickled. He's like, that loser is reaping what he has sowed. He has made bad choices, and he needs to pay for everything. He needs to pay for all the hurt, all the confusion, all the pain that he has caused. Thank God that monkey's gone, he's saying. But the father, the father is interesting. Every afternoon after his work is finished, um, the father would go for a walk out to the far edges of the farm, and he would stand there until it got dark, looking to the horizon, hoping that maybe this would be the day that his son might come home. His heart is broken. His heart is broken. He hated to let his son leave, but, but the only way he knew for him to possibly ever come back was that he had to let him go freely. So, put a pin in that. Now we are at the middle of the story, and now that we're at the middle of the story, I want to ask you a question. Who are you in this parable? Which one of these characters are you most like or that you most have connection to? Do you, do you feel a connection to the younger brother? Or do you kind of understand maybe how the older brother kind of feels? Or do you connect it to the father? I know for myself, um, I, I for a long time in my life was the younger brother. Wild living. Going, I was from Craig, Colorado. We know what wild living is in Craig, let me tell you. And uh, I went my own way. And uh, I spent some time in, in a distant land. You know, I went away and did my own thing. And uh, one of the things I learned in all those years is I learned that uh, you can't, no one gets away with sin for too long. Sin always comes back to bite you. It always comes back to bite you. It always comes, sin always comes prepackaged with a consequence and a regret. I found that true in my life, right? And, and sin always costs you more then you want it to pay and makes you stay longer than you wanted to stay. And so I've been to there and I've gone to that. But here's the thing. And, and so at some point in my life, I came back home. But when I came back from my distant land, I didn't come back with the heart of the father. I came back with the heart of the older brother. I came back and started doing the church thing and the religious thing and getting right. And, and I became judgmental. And I became very critical of others. I, I, I became proud of my, uh, my goodness and my righteousness, my right standing with God. I'm like, look at, look at me, the reverend, Pastor Troy Lewis. That's how I'd like you to address me from now on. And I assumed in my mind that God was pretty proud of me as well. Because why? I was obedient. I was doing what he told me to do to the T. I followed his rules. But here's the thing. I wasn't very compassionate. I was obedient, but I wasn't compassionate. Because I'd forgotten what it was like to be alone and to be lost and to be afraid. And I often just looked over and looked past and looked away from those who were like that. And I ignored them in my life. But then um, I began to read uh, the Gospels and began to read a little bit about Jesus. And, of course, I was confronted with the message of this parable and the duplicity in my life, this, this two-faced two thing that I was doing, right? I realized that I often like to take on God's role as judge and jury and even executioner. And I often saw people through, uh, through my self-righteousness rather than through God's grace. That's how I would look at you. But slowly but surely, Jesus um, helped me kind of remove the, the two by four out of my own eye, and I began to see clearer. Um, I saw the Pharisee that was hiding inside of me, and I began to see the divine 
that was hiding inside of others. I began to see God in other people, even those who may not thought that they were godly. And then, little by little, I began to see my role in this story, who I was in this story. I saw what God's love for me required of me. I saw what God did for me, and I realized I've got to do this for someone else. I needed to do less judging and more searching and more looking and more finding and more helping. And I began to ask God, God, help me to see people the way you see people. Help help me to not just see what they've done or what, what they're doing now. Help me to be able to see what they might actually become and to to feed to that. Help me to respond to them the way you respond to them. Help me to view sinners the way you view sinners. Help me to be like the father in the parable of the lost son. That I would see the people around me like that. And so, let me ask you another question. Who are you in this story? Are you the younger brother? I mean, is that how you're feeling tonight when you look at your life? Is there a part of you that goes, I don't like what I see? I I don't, I don't, I, 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 maybe there's a part of you that as you look at your life, you're like, you're wondering, how did I get here? How did I get in such this crazy situation. That's funny, by the way. In verse 17, Jesus says that Jesus said that the boy was looking at pig slop and he, and, 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 he, and he came to his senses. You ever had one of those moments where you just kind of looked in the mirror and went, oh, man. And, uh, he came to his senses. At some point, this young man realized that what was really going on That he had been bewitched and he'd been following something that was just a vapor, that was a mist, that wasn't real. And and, and he'd believed some things that weren't true. And he thought, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this to myself? I never should have left. (laughs) There were, were, things were so much better back, back home with my father. And so he swallows his pride. That younger brother swallows his pride. He begins walking this long journey back home. I just wonder if any of you resonate with that, that maybe that's where you are in your life. You know, maybe you're like, I've made some bad choices, I've hurt some people, and I now realize that I'm only hurting myself by staying dug in right here. This isn't working. I just want to suggest to you, uh, don't wait. Go back home. Come back to your father, man. I'm telling you, don't wait another second. Don't stay in the pig slop one more minute. Amen? Yeah, yeah. Now, this might be harder for some of us to admit, but I wonder if there's anyone here who feels a little more like the older brother. You kind of lean towards the, I ain't like that. Uh, You kind of lean towards the, I've uh, done it right approach to life. I, you know, you, 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 you're like, I've played by the rules. I uh, haven't made any, thank God, I haven't made any mistakes, major mistakes. And I just really don't understand how people can screw up their lives so bad. I don't understand why people do what they do. I don't, I don't get that. And maybe there's a part of you that just kind of feels uh, morally superior to the people around you, you know, to some of the people in your life. Um, maybe you just have a, a, a certainty about you. You just know that you know, and you kind of walk with that certainty, especially when it comes to God. If you had a bumper sticker on your car, it would probably read, uh, the Bible says it, I believe it, and that settles it. Remember those? Maybe that there's a part of you that's like that. I don't know. If you're unsure of your older brother tendencies, if you're not sure you have some older brother tendencies, um, Jesus gives you a little test. Here's a test. In verse 20, Jesus said this. He said, but while the younger son was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with blank. While the son was a long ways off, the father saw him and the father's heart was filled with what? What what word would you put in there? Um, Resentment? Of course. If this had happened to you, you're like, oh man, he's come back home. Right? 
or maybe it's bitterness, you're just like, oh, I can't even look at this guy. Or perhaps uh, suspicion. Maybe you're like, oh, oh, now you're coming home. Lost everything, famine, all that, pig slop. Now you're coming home. You're not sorry. You're not, don't tell me you're sorry. You're just saying sorry because, you know, you got caught. I'm just wondering if any of you might feel that way about people in your life or about life and, and that you'd be willing to admit, yeah, you know what, there are times that I'm like the older brother. I kind of look down my nose at people who are so screwed up. I would ask you to raise your hand. I don't know if anyone would. But I see some nods. But here's the thing I want you to get, and don't miss this. In all of Jesus' parables, one of the characters represents God. In this parable, of course, it's the Father, right? It's the Father. And, it, and this is the thing you need to understand. It's the Father's response that is the point of this parable. Jesus told this long story, and he wants us to recognize the response that the Father has to the Son. That is the point of Of the parable. Now, what's funny about this parable, and you know this is true, is that it's become known as the name of this parable is known as the prodigal son, right? But that's not how Jesus told the story. He started by telling the story by saying this. Remember, he said this there was a man who had two sons. The story is about the man. The story is about the father. This is what we forget. We always think about the son. It's about the father. It is about the father's response to what the son did. That is the point of the parable. Jesus is saying, listen, this is how God sees sinners. This is how God sees those people that mess up around us, those people who are always fouling up. He sees them as lost and separated. And his whole purpose isn't to pay them back, but to bring them back and to restore them. That's what he wants. I mean, here's the word that Jesus would put in that blank. He, said, he would say, but while, while this younger son was still a long ways off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. His heart was filled with compassion for this person that done him so wrong. That blows my mind because like I said for many years, um, I filled in that blank differently. As, a, a, as good, th- here's my point, as good and as moral as I was back in those years, I was nothing like the father in this story. Now, do you remember what happens next in the story? Um, let me read, I'll quickly do it. Jesus says that the father, when he saw the son, ran out to his son and embraced him and kissed him. Now, Jesus is telling this story and the audience hears this and they're like, ooh, that kid probably had a bunch of pig slop on him. Ooh, that's gross. But they were also thinking, what is wrong with this father? He's he's gone cuckoo. Jesus would say, nothing is wrong with his father. This was God's response to sinners who come back home. That's what Jesus wants us to know. This was God's response to us. He embraces us and kisses us and wipes us off and puts a new robe on us, puts on a new ring and some sandals and says, kill the fattened calf, let's have a party. It's funny, if you read the story, the son starts to apologize and explain his actions and the father isn't even listening to him. It's like they're having two conversations. The son's like, I'm really sorry. I've sinned against you and against God. And the father's like, hey, go kill the fat cat. Get the fire on. It's barbecue time party. I mean, they're just having these two conversations, right? He's too busy planning for a party to listen to the apology. And when the older brother hears about this, he blows a gasket. When he hears about this party, he loses it. In verse 28, Jesus says that the older brother becomes angry and he refuses to go to his father. And so the father had to come out of the party to to see and talk to the son, and he pleaded with him. And I would suggest to you that he's pleading with us too tonight. He's like, please don't do this. Don't miss what's really happening around you right now. Something big is happening. 
And, and so he goes out and he, he acts and begs the son to listen. And the older son starts listing all the good things. I've been to church. I go, to, I tithe. I wear, I've done this and all these things. And the father's not. He's like, yes, I know you've got it. And he says, I know what you've done in verse 31. And you need to understand this, that everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours and it's always been that way. But listen to me. Listen to me, son. We have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. But now he's alive again. That, we gotta do this. He was dead and now he's alive. This is a resurrection. <laughs> he goes on, he says, he was lost. And now he has been found. And everybody instantly goes, oh. This is the greatest thing that the father could imagine. The son was lost. And he's come back home. And this is why, my friend, Jesus came to this planet. He came to seek and save that which was lost. You and me. People that are not here. People live next door to us. People that we work with. People that are family. My point is very simply this. As followers of Jesus, we know, we can know that we are in step with God. We are in sync with our Heavenly Father when we begin to feel the way He feels about the lost. If we don't feel compassion for them, if our heart doesn't ache for those who are not here and don't understand this and don't know this good news, then we have some work to do in our hearts. If we're not out there doing our own form of a search party for those who are lost and praying for them, we are missing the whole point of Jesus and why he came. And so... Who are you? Are you the younger brother? And it's possible, if, if you are, let me just say to you, perhaps it's time for you to turn and come back home. Don't wait another minute. You'll never regret coming to God sooner. You'll, nev you'll never regret that. Are you the older brother? Maybe it's time for you to stop judging, stop mm, icky, ooh, and start loving or most importantly, are you like this father? This father who was willing to bankrupt the farm to win back his son. Brilliant. We should think about that as we come into Easter. We should pray about our role in this story and who we are and what we can do. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let me pray. Uh, God, I pray as we come to this most holy time of the year when we celebrate what you have done for us, how Jesus came and died on a cross for us and died on the cross for our sins and then was raised from the dead to bring us hope. God, I pray that you'll help us not forget them. Those people in our lives that you've placed there on purpose, perhaps, that maybe... Uh, we're to reach out to and to, to extend a hand to and to notice and to try to remember the days when we were alone and afraid and had nothing and had no hope, that you would do something in our hearts and help us to see the people around us in a different way and to see ourselves in your story and to realize that you have placed us in the middle of this story, in the middle of these circumstances and these situations and these places so that we might participate with you in finding the lost and perhaps bringing them back home to their father.